I've learned kind of a new new policy in my life that the older I've gotten, the more I realize that people don't want to know the truth. I mean, I can pretty much demonstrate that on the internet pretty fast. I, I tell people, okay, look, we are in an information age. We've been given the internet, and obviously if you're watching my video or you're reading my blogs, then you have internet access. You also have access to Google search, Alta Vista search, any search engine you want, Bing, any number of search engines to find out facts. Now, it's true there may be lots of websites out there with lots of opinions that look like facts, but you can weed them out and, you know, just like you would shop around for certain products. You can begin to decide for yourself what the facts are and what's a better product. So, I've come to a conclusion after doing this a lot by telling people to Google it that they really don't want to know the truth. They like being deceived. And I've seen this over and over again that if they have some pet project or some weird idea that they like, it doesn't matter that it's wrong. They hang on to it. And I think that's part of the end times, you know. It's, I'm, I'm not sure why, you know, and I, I feel bad about it, you know, but God finally gave me a kind of a humorous way of looking at it, but it's a truth that I do apply now. And I call it love them and leave them. You know, is that when I run into people that are absolutely wrong on something that's serious enough to involve their salvation or, you know, maybe the salvation of others because it's interfering with their understanding of God or misrepresenting God in some way, and I don't mean some minor way, I mean some major way, then I love them enough to say something. I don't say to them specifically what's wrong, but I address who they should be focusing in on. In other words, I'll discuss and talk about maybe their subject, whatever it may be, their pet idea. You have to apologize, or I apologize for kind of like slouching and getting kind of down, because I'm basically sick. I'm just feeling really worn out a lot lately this time of year. So anyways, people will tend to get trapped in their own mindset. And even when you have the truth, they don't want to know it. They they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to come to reality of it. My wife, I know that when we first got together, I used to confront her on issues and was pretty adamant about it. And there was times that it took her a long time to come to her own conclusions because, you know, I would state my case very, very straightforward. You know, it's here it is, here it is, and here's why you think this and why you think that. And, blah, blah. and she never really had a chance to think about it, but, you know, she, on her own, when she had time to think, came to the same conclusion and would come back to me later and say, you know, I hate it when you're right. And I'd smile, but I'd say, well, you know, it's not that I'm right, but I've been around for a long time and I know what's wrong. So <laughs> when you know what's wrong, eventually you figure out what's right. Well, with people, in my policy of love them and leave them, is that I love them, don't get me wrong, but I got to leave them behind, you know, sometimes because they just want to mollow or wallow sometimes in, you know, the mud and the blood and the guts and the booze and the beer and whatever worldly ungodliness or questionable theologies that they're in because they, they, for whatever reason, have entrenched themselves into hanging on to it at all costs as though their faith is based upon error and not in a person. See how that works? You can't have faith based upon some error or even the Bible. You have to have faith from a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you what's called saving faith in the beginning. Is that He gives you the gift of faith that's a gift of the Holy Spirit to come to uh, ability to make a decision, a conscious choice between stepping forward and accepting what God is saying to you at the point where you're getting ready to make a decision to follow Jesus the rest of your life and to ask him to come into your life and to take over your life, to fill you with his Holy Spirit. 
So he gives you that gift of faith in order to make that conscious decision. But then after that, faith is in a person. It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but it's from the word of God being spoken to you by the Holy Spirit, making it applicable to you. So it's actually a person, the person of Jesus, making real the word of God, the written, who he is. He said he's the word, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was God. It sounds a little mystical, and it is, but he was there at the beginning. And so as he is the word, then he, speaking it, makes it real in your life by the Holy Spirit, and you respond to it. So when a person doesn't respond to the truth or doesn't accept, you know, a certain amount of general kind of like I'm trying to steer you in the right direction posts, then I leave them. You know, it's like, well, you know, I said my piece. Here's what the reader can get out of it. And I usually have a, a means with which I can present where people should look, what they should look for and how they should look at it. Then I walk away. I don't go personally attacking someone in their blindness or in their narrow mindedness or in their failure to understand at that moment in time what it is that I may be presenting. I allow like a gardener for that seed to be planted and hopefully to be accomplished in the future by someone else watering or someone else doing something that may hopefully cause a chain of events to happen in that person's life that they would come to the right conclusion and know Jesus in a more personal and intimate way. So for me, it's like I use it as a love them and leave them. You know, I don't, I don't expect to change anyone's mind. I really don't. I mean, that's not for me to do. But I have always had the policy that whatsoever it is that the Lord is telling you to do, that you should do. That's my motto. Whatsoever, anything, in my mind, whatsoever the Lord and I always use the Lord as meaning, you know, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, however God is leading you, guiding you. Whatsoever the Lord is telling you to do. And I mean telling. Now, I don't mean, you know, just kind of like, well, I think I should, or maybe I should, or the Scripture says, or the Bible says. No, I say what the Lord tells you to do. That you should do. Because anyone can make up some poor excuse of taking some Scripture out of context. But when the Lord tells you to do something, you know you've been told. Because you're willing to own up to it by saying, yes, the Lord told me to do it. Then you're responsible and accountable to him. I'll let you go. After that, you know, if hey, if you tell me God told you, hey, I'm all hands off. That's you and God, then you deal with it. And that's the way we should be with each other. We should bring each other to a place of personal responsibility, yes. And accountability, most definitely. But accountable to our Father, not to each other. We're only accountable to each other insofar as the things that matter to a relationship being established between us. Because in reality, some relationships that are between the person and the father is for the father and the person to work out, not for you and I. You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink both you and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. 2 Kings 3.16 and 17. To human thinking, this was simply impossible, but nothing is too hard for God. Without a sound, without a sign, from sources invisible and apparently impossible, the floods came stealing in all night long, and when the morning dawned, those ditches were flooded with crystal waters and reflecting the rays of the morning sun from the red hills of Edom. Our unbelief is always wanting some outward sign. The religion of many is largely sensational because they are looking for the sensationalized and the demonstrative. And they are not easily satisfied with its genuineness unless there is some kind of manifestation of some supernatural way of it looking feeling, or appearing. But the greatest triumph of faith is to be still and know that He is God. For myself, in dealing with people, that's what I have to do. I have to love them and leave them and let them go because then I can let God do what He chooses to do and bring about the accomplishment of His purpose in their life. Now, there's also the opposite that when the enemy comes in like a flood and attacks me, 
I don't resist. Oh, I resist the devil, but I don't come back and say, you devil, you, you be gone, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, and I anoint this building and these walls and these falls and all this other stuff with oil and, you know, kind of like light candles and, you know, get all incense stuff and, you know, and do all these other things. No, I just say, hey, you know, Lord, I don't have time for this. You know, if you want me to do what you want me to do, then you got to take care of what you can do because I can't do what you can do and you wanted me to do what I need you to do for me and you're allowing me to participate in. So can we together work this out as a team? Can you take care of the spiritual matters since you're spirit? And can I take care of like these little physical matters you want me to do, you know, and you've asked me to do or that I think that you want me to do or whatever maybe that you're telling me to do? So that way, God, you take care of the spiritual and I'll take care of the physical and we can work cooperatively. And you know what? Works for me. Now, maybe for you, you need to go out and, you know, get some little blankies, you know, and toss it in the air. Maybe you need some little, you know, red candles and white candles and purple candles and whatever candles. And you need to have them stacked all over corners of your room. Maybe you need to put a mezuzah on your doorpost. Or maybe you need to put, you know, little lockets on your earlings or whatever. You know, but fringe on your clothes. But God doesn't need those things. <laughs> You're asking God for help, but if you really want to feel like you're doing it, okay, then, you know, get all worked up and get into it and get filled up and fed up and feeling like you're something and then go do it. But the reality is, is God can take care of it for you. All you got to do is ask him. The great victory of faith is to stand before some impassable Red Sea and hear the master say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. As we step out without any sign or sound, not a wave splash or wetting of our very feet as we take the first step into the waters, still marching on we shall see the sea divide and the pathway open through the very midst of the waters. More often than not, that is what people's faith is built upon. It's not built upon sitting still and talking to God and having a conversation. It's not built upon having a real life experience of God and being able to say, I've heard God speak audibly. I know what his voice sounds like. I've heard him talk to me. I have seen the Lord, as some would say. I, ha I personally, let's clarify this. I have not seen the Lord. Yes, I've heard him talk to me. He's talked to me, direct. Now, I've not seen the Lord, you know. Um, Lord? He said, I don't think so. Ask me when I'm not sick. <laughs> Anyways, but... There are those that have seen the Lord. There are those that have heard the Lord. There are those that have walked with God and talked with God. But that's not what Christians want. You see, Christians want the feeling, not the person. They want to get in a corporate, generic crowd of excitement, like a rock star concert, and get the Holy Spirit concert going. They want to feel the fire. They want to know the presence. They want to hype the emotion. They want to ah, glorify God as though God had come down from heaven to be on earth in the midst of the masses. And in some ways, according to their faith, God honors it. But you know, that's not what God is all about. Jesus took 12 men and said on the night that he was betrayed, I pray, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. That they may know you as I know you that they may see you as I have seen you, that they may hear you as I have heard you. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really want to go to a mega ministry and be part of a mega mass and get campused out and programmed for some kind of ministerial meetings that I need to do in a certain format. But I do want to have a personal relationship with God 
so that I would be just as willing as the man who saw this blind man come in his door. And he took care of him for three days and ministered to him. And the man was Paul that was blind, but received grace and mercy from someone who was walking with God that God talked to. So you may be content with where you're at in your religion and religious observation, but for me, I'm going to have to love you and leave you because I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I'd love you to be there and then together we could talk to God and walk with Him and hear His voice. But you know, I'm not sure that's what you want. And until you know what you want, I'm not sure where you're going to go and what you're going to do. But I am sure of one thing, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do.